Martina Crudden, welcome <laughs> to the Joe Dalton Show. I was doing a chair last week because it was the first time I actually, in four and a half years, said the Joe Dalton Show. We're you know, <laughs> maybe the second person that I do the woo with that. <laughs> It'll get quite boring after a while. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but, what what I call it now? What I call it now? But and you have a fascinating story. We all have stories. Uh, your story for what resonated with me was if I heard your story and then I tried to tell some of my story, they go, would you ever go away? And, you know, there's loss of children in your life. There's stress. There's PS, PTS on it, health issues. You had a near death experience, which got you down into hypnosis, rebooting of the mind, a mm -hmm. journey of self discovery. What else? What else? Tell. You're a mm. you're a coach. You're a consultant. You're a mom. You're. So, oh, Martina, welcome to my show. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for asking me. And um, you know, when you're reading out, it's like, oh God, you know, you forget the journey. Maybe sometimes that you've you've been on, or it's like, um, yeah, my heart starts racing when you when I think of the pain and the um the suffering that I have endured but I have come such a long way and um yeah as you said it's been a, this past five years in particular have been a bit of a journey for me to to re to find myself really and where from pain and heartache yeah it's it's interesting because it is all about the you know the journey of the mind we we are here for this journey it's never ending and I always say, like with, with when I'm speaking to my daughter or speaking to my son about their teenage years, I said there will always be casualties uh, when we're growing up, and that is people will will die, people will have some sort of health issues, or so, someone will have some sort of breakdown. But you were sort of catapulted into motherhood at sixteen. Yeah. Um, I remember mm -hmm. being in my thirties, and my son's mother was 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 pregnant, and. I was frightened to tell my father at 30. And then when I said it to him, he went, oh, well, you know, washing the dishes. And that thought of telling someone at, at mm. 16 must have been, a, must have been, Jesus Christ, that, freaking, that must have been a shock in itself, was it? Terrifying, really. Um, especially back then, it was, um, you know, it's, what, 27 years ago, so... To some people, it mightn't seem a very long time, but back then things were quite different. And teenage pregnancy was very much frowned upon. And, you know, I was so afraid of telling my grandmother, really, more so than my, than my mother and father. And I didn't really even have to tell them because I think they guessed because I was so sick. I was really, really sick. And I remember being in school and actually getting sick into my, my school bag you know, trying yeah. to do exams and the fear of letting people know and what they would think of you. And, um, oh my gosh, it's been, um, even thinking about it now, I don't know how I actually got through that, but I knew if in my heart that this, this child was a gift and, um, that there was nothing going to, to change the, um, that I, I, he was a blessing in, in my life. You know, there's people probably watching this and they're doing the calculation of the thing. God, she doesn't look that old. She only looks about 21. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I wish. <laughs> yeah, nah, I that's, wish. Yeah, that's it. But that's when tragedy happened as well in your life, was it? Was, was that, you know, the, that roller coaster? But before we get into that and then mm. that whole awakening, what was it like for you? Were you just like the rest of us? Were you just a normal teenager trying to have a laugh? No, not really. When I think about it now, no, no, I was very much, um, uh, I would have been very afraid of what people thought about me. Do you know, um, my grandmother was considered um, with a healer, a spiritual healer. And the, f the fear of telling her because the, the Catholic Church had such a huge influence over um, over people at that time really and I knew of other girls and family members that had that were taken away you know to be um 
the launderettes. Yeah, yeah. And it was only a few years previous to that, you know, that that may have been the option for me, for me as well. So I was very much aware of that at, at 15, you know, and I, I, the fear was like... Yeah, because if you look at going back, like the dogma religion the, that ruled Ireland was, was more powerful than the police. You know, they, they had control over everything. Um, the politicians, it was so backward, even. And that was, like, when did the Landerettes close down? In the 80s, was it? Do you know, the yeah. last one closed in, was it 80s or early 90s? 90s, yeah. But it's it, how barbaric it was and how shameful we should be about it. Even the, it, the, the, the stupidity of, you know, burying people outside the church because they were excommunicated you know bonkers absolutely bonkers you know yeah and you know it was also i was told by the by the priest i was going to hell Do you know that was that was, i remember going to to confessions and being told that i was going to hell and i couldn't get my head around this how when a, a child is a gift you know from god that's the way i felt even at that young age it i was very much um probably an old soul in a way as well you know and i really had a deep faith that journey which which led you down to your life was that your son that passed away yeah 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 Yeah. so so i had daniel when i was um 16 and um i met my husband a year later we've been together ever since and um i have four other beautiful girls and yeah I suppose growing up it wasn't wasn't easy and but I always knew I always had this drive that I would be the best mother and I would do whatever it took you know to provide the best life for him I was so determined to go to college you know and to work and to give him to provide for for us and to not um and to prove everybody wrong, maybe in a way that I couldn't be yeah, a good mother. Yeah. Do you know, I had this, I'll do it. I, I know I can do it. And, and I, I did, you know, it was, it was like all the eyes were on you. And when you're still at school and I had to go back and finish school and, um, and do my leave insert just four weeks after he was born. And um, that was a huge challenge in itself as well. I had an older brother who died at birth or a couple of weeks after birth. And my father said, my mother never got over it. You never forget over your children, you know, and that's the one thing that we all hope is that uh, you outlive your children. That's the one thing, the heartbreak on it. And there's lessons to be learned in it. And do you, do you feel that the the stress and the PTS and the illness was all caused from that traumatic time when, when your son passed away? Yeah, well, actually, previous to that, 18 months before, Daniel died when he was, um, when he was 17. He was driving into school yeah. and was hit. Um, now, he didn't die straight away. You know, he, he lived for five days. And so we, we had made a decision, you know, to donate his organs. But 18, 18 months previous to that, we had lost a wee girl called Jamie Lee. So she died when she was four days old. So, you know, that, it, that whole... That whole time was 2009 and um, we, had, we were told there was something wrong with the pregnancy. So it was a bit of a roller coaster throughout that. Um, I'd lost two babies to miscarriage previous to that. And um, the pregnancy was quite stressful. And, you know, they told us that she would need a heart operation when she was born. So I, I stayed in hospital in the rotunda in dublin for six weeks previous before she had um before she was born to try and get her to a certain weight so they could do this heart operation and so when she was born it was the 20 and 24th of september and 2009 so she was born that day and when they transferred her over to crumlin to do the heart operation i followed over because i'd just given birth and I showered and, you know, followed them over. They wouldn't let us go in the ambulance. 
And when we got in through the hospital doors, they had said, you know, we think she's okay. Like her heart is, is fine. So it was like all our prayers had been answered, you know, and yeah. over the next few days, then that unfolded that her kidneys hadn't developed. And now we had been told that her kidneys were perfect. Do you know that we had seen it, that I'd been examined by so many numerous doctors and experts and, and then they discovered that her nappies weren't wet. So then they decided they'd do more tests. And so they discovered that our kidneys hadn't developed, so they weren't working properly. So her wee system was being poisoned. But I remember the morning that she, um, it was a few days later and I was down in the chapel in, in Crumlin, you know, in the hospital. And I remember looking at a, a statue and just saying, you know, if you're going to take her, please don't let her suffer any longer. And I left that, the chapel in Crumlin and I was heading up back up the stairs into the, the ICU and the nurse was coming to get me and I said, she's going, isn't she? And they said, yeah. And I said, okay. So then they, I said, just take all, take the machines, take everything off her and just hand her to me. And so that's when she passed away, you know, in our arms. That, and that was on the 27th of September, 2009. And then you know, you're trying to grieve. And then I discovered that I was um, expecting and then my son was killed on, um, he actually died on the 5th of March. It was five days after his accident, but we had gathered with him. So I was still grieving yeah. or actually hadn't even really grieved if I'm truly honest, you know, and then, then the next thing, Daniel had been taken from us. So, so it was quite... As well, isn't it? quite traumatic and plus I was six months pregnant when Daniel had died so I didn't know how I was going to even give birth on the fear of losing this child as well and plus my other daughters were um, starting to ask questions as in who's going to die next because that's to them they just experience so much death and fear so it was quite a yeah quite a tough time it's it's like um it's like a roller coaster, of, you know, all this grief that's building up inside mm. you. And it's a test. And, and some people will, will, will disagree with that, but it, you were probably bottling it all up as well. And you said that, that you probably hadn't grieved. And I think as humans, we sort of take stuff on and, and don't express it because, you know, yeah. you were, you were, you were grown and said, I'm going to be the best. And I'm going to go to college and I'm going to prove everybody wrong. <laughs> and by saying that as well, you were also bottling up all those other grieving emotions that you had. So even though you were going to, going to prove them all wrong by doing that, all this stuff was coming in and you went expressing it out either. Yeah, very true. Yeah. yeah. You know, you don't even realize until you're older, that you didn't even really have your childhood was cut so short, yeah, you know, yeah. and even though I was great fun and great crack to be out with and, you know, loved life, love going out. So I had lost quite a few friends through road accidents, road traffic That's accidents right. as well. And my own cousin. And on so many occasions I was supposed to be there and it just didn't happen. I, I you know, I kept questioning why I survived and they didn't. You know, I had yeah, so much that's guilt. The survival guilt, isn't it? Yeah. The, uh, yeah. On it. And, and that's probably part of the PTS as well. When did you have the, the near death experience or dying? And, you know, I've interviewed one or two people on the show before who have died and have had these ex experiences and then, and then came back. When did that happen to you? Okay. So after Daniel died, I, you know, would have thrown myself into fundraising and trying to make purpose of it, you know, was trying to make, you know, his life worthwhile and would have fundraised for the hospital and for the road, Irish Road Victims Association. And, you know, I was doing so much and I was trying to support everybody else, you know, his, oh my God, the amount of friends, you know, and then our house never emptied for, for a good year. And so I was constantly keeping myself busy and trying to get on with things. And plus I had four girls. So 
I had no choice. I, you know, I remember the morning after Daniel's funeral and they were like, okay, mommy, we have to go to school. And I'm like, oh my God, give me a break. You know, and just wanted to pull the, where's, where's the covers up. Vodka? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but it just goes to show with kids, like they're so resilient and sometimes can, they kept me going, you know, and I had to get up for them. I don't think if I had had them, I probably wouldn't have, you know, so I, I threw myself into doing so much. But eventually what happened was I had um, been speaking at different events, you know, for road safety, for transition year students. So where we'd speak to like three or 400 students in it's a, um, a program that was developed with the guards and with an undertaker and with um, the consultant of Cavan hospital, Dr. Ashraf Butt, and he was, you know, Daniel's doctor as well. Yep. And so this, this program had been developed. And what happened was I'd spoke at them quite a few times. And one day I was in, in Cav and speaking at one of them. And whatever happened, I was behind a screen and like all of the students were to the, to the left of me. And they were watching this video of a road accident and it was playing music. And I could hear the scratching of the tires and it just brought me back, back to where, yeah, because I had come across Daniel's accident the morning that he had died. So I'd been there and it just hit me and I just, my body just went, just shut, shut down. I ended up going home and getting into bed and slowly but surely my body started to give up. I got sicker and sicker and it just started to, to shut down. And um, what happened was I was hemorrhaging and I went, my husband found me in the bathroom one night and brought me straight to A&E and they'd left me nearly too long. So I, w I knew I was dying, Do you know, I was, there was nothing left for me and it took so long to get me to theatre. But I, during that, I had left my body and I, could, I had met my son and my daughter. And I was watching them working on me. Yeah. And um, that was one of the incidences. There, there's been two actually. But um, that was when I had actually, I'd been told I had to come back. Um, that I had work to do and work to do with, with the youth. And, um, and to try and make a difference in the world, which I felt I was doing anyway. But it was like. This is a kick. Yeah, this was a huge it's, kick. It's yeah. like Jeff Olson, who we interviewed her a while back. He was in a car accident, yeah. and he had that, you know, um, de life death experience. And he was looking in the operating theater, and they were operating on him. And he was looking, yeah, you know, looking at him. And his wife, who passed away, was looking as well. And the doctor, he could see Jeff's wife in the room as well. You know, it's mad stuff, you know. That's right. I, I have, I know the two Jeffs as well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, the, the energy though, I did not want to come back. I, you know, the peace, the love, the beauty, the just pure, pure love. I did not want to come back because I knew it was going to be a difficult road to actually rebuild myself firstly. And, um, yeah, but I knew I was coming. <laughs> I knew I was coming back. You're coming back, and that's where the journey begins. We're going to take a quick break, and we're going to just come right back, okay? You're listening to Joe Dalton on Dublin South FM, crossing the Rubicon. You were just telling it. We were just leading up to your 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 life story, which sort of brought you down on a journey, which let's call it it was the discovery the self-discovery all this had happened to you good and bad and it's all a learning process and it's all it's all still there very much with you and i know some people are probably when they hear your story or they don't know what to say next because when they hear so much tragedy and stuff they're going to go now what what's what do i say to this person mm. your experience or wisdom is to help other people as well that's that's the truth but to get from there came back and you go i need to rebuild and it was the power of the mind or discovering about the mind that probably got you on that road to discovery 
through the likes of NLP and all the, you know the story, I mentioned this a lot in a lot of shows, is the dark night of the soul. You, you had, you've had an awful lot of them. Did you have that spiritual awakening after I went, holy God, that there's more to life here? Yeah, well, for starters, I didn't know if I really believed in anything after that. You know, I didn't know if I, if there was, you know, I thought when you died, that was it. You know, apart from certain signs that started to make me question everything. And then when I had my own near death experience, then I realized that death was not the end. And um, although, although that had happened to me, I didn't tell anybody about it. And even in the hospital, they had come to me because they knew that they'd made massive failings for me to actually um, to pursue a, a case. And I was like, no. And, you know, my family couldn't understand why I wouldn't. And I didn't tell them. I, I thought if I'd said this, they're going to think I'm crazy. Do you yeah. know, they really are going to, that nobody would believe me. So I, I kept it to myself and I started to question. And I remember lying, you know, I couldn't walk. I was, it took me months and months to recover physically. And I remember lying on the couch in my, my living room and the girls were coming in from school and they, I could see the pain in their eyes when, you know, I couldn't get up to even make a dinner. And I remember thinking, excuse my language, but F this, <laughs> do yeah. you know, there has to be, you need to help me. What am I supposed to do? You know, I just kind of, the energy just exploded in me. And I was like, what do you want from me? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to help anybody if I can't even help myself and get up yeah. and make my kids dinner? And um, that's when things started to change for me. It was like, I started to discover neuro-linguistic programming. And I mean, I was on so much medication as well that I was so sick. The near-death experience, you know, then they, they didn't know what was actually wrong with me. They, I still wasn't fit to walk. I was still bleeding constantly from, um, they thought I had breast cancer. They thought I had a brain tumor. So I said, they had to go through, you know, lots and lots of tests. And part of me was still questioning, am I actually dying? Am I, am I sick? Like, am I going to die? So that, there was still an element of fear there, but it was, I knew that there had to be something else. And so I discovered neuro-linguistic programming and it, I, I, don't, I don't even know how, but I think it was on my phone when I was lying on the couch and it popped up. So I started to research it and I discovered that Richard Bandler was coming to London that October. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go to this. This is going to be the answer. And that was the start of how to retrain the mind. Because nobody told me that every time I was thinking of the thoughts that I was thinking, every time I was driving the road, I was reliving the cr crash every single morning because I have to go that way. There was no avoiding it. It was there every day for me to, to drive through it again. So nobody tells you the power of your thought and what it does emotionally to the body. So I was like, the penny started to drop. And I was like, oh my God, this is what's wrong. This is what has happened to my body. Physically, it started to, it couldn't take anymore. So then I started with energy healing and Reiki and neuro-linguistic programming really, really helped me to, to reframe my mind and the images and the thoughts that I was having. The mind is such an amazing piece of machinery and we forget how powerful it is, but we also forget how much damage that it does to ourselves. It's stuff that is stored inside the brain that can really affect us and we're conditioned and we're programmed to pick up the negative and not embrace the positive. And that's the weirdest thing about the whole brain. It's like you talk about NLP. We were using NLP in, in work before there was even a name for NLP. Mm. You know, we were using it, um, you know, the art of persuasion, the awakening, the realization that you are a sovereign being and you can make a difference in that world are you there are you still on that journey do you still wake up in the morning and go i've no idea what i'm doing today or do you kind of go i do know what i'm doing but i'm 
still have that fear. You can call it the monkey mind or, you know, the, you know, the, the devil or whatever it may be. Is that still sitting in the back going, you know, I'm still going to hold you back here. I'm still going to hold you back. Um, most of the time, no, I don't have that. You know, of course, there's days that you have doubt and question and um but i'm so i'm pretty i'm so good because i've done so much work on myself i mean i i i haven't stopped in five years really working and it, it's just it fascinates me the power of the mind because within six weeks my body was completely healed my body was what you know i was diagnosed with fibromyalgia post-traumatic stress disorder and um, irritable bowel syndrome my bladder wasn't working you know, every part from head to toe, migraine, I was on heart medication, I was on everything. And it was like, oh my God, how do we not know this? Do you think Joe Dispenza going through the Joe Dispenza process mm. helped you there with through that? Because anyone that, you know, I'm sure a lot of people know if they're listening to shows, they know about Joe Dispenza and the way that he healed himself. And that's the power of the mind that... Do you feel that was part of the process or how you'd, had you already achieved that before you went to Joe Dispenza? I had, I had already achieved that before yeah. I went to Joe. And then when I went to Joe Dispenza, you know, it was like all the pieces just started the, the to... The piece of the jigsaw. Yeah, yeah. The light bulb went off and it was like, oh my God, because I had been reading his books and I didn't know again how... Like I had to give up everything, Joe. I wasn't fit to work, you know. Um, I was struggling. Like, but I was so determined to, to find ways if, if I could heal my body and I, I could teach this to my kids because they were going through a lot of the trauma as well. And the difference that it made to them, I was like, how do people not know about this? But of course they did, which I just, I, I presume that. <laughs> look what I found. Look what I found. Yeah. What I, found. <laughs> I was going to heal the world. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. This is what excites me so much about the whole process is that this is so old yeah. right? and so simple. It's not like you're learning quantum physics, mathematical algorithms that you need to figure out. Yeah. This stuff is so basic. Okay. And I, I don't mean that being disrespectful to us all, yeah. that it is so simple. <laughs> if you are willing to just stop, put in the time and see where it goes. A simple thing. I'm doing a process at the moment, which is the present process. And it's 15 minutes breathing in the morning, 15 minutes breathing in the evening, just breathing. Mm -hmm. Do you know, when you read, ah, oh, easy breathing. Sure, I have to breathe. I'd drop dead if I don't breathe. But sitting in that 15 minutes is so painful because you're not doing anything else. We've come, we come a... A society of you know self gratification and instant. We want something that's instant. So sitting in that mind and breathing, like I'm going the first time I'm checking the checking the clock. Oh shit! I've only done seventeen seconds. <laughs> oh, I've done two minutes. And some days I, I I don't do the two fifty minutes. The hardest thing for us to do is stop and just breathe. Yeah. Isn't that the most craziest thing in the world? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, anyone that has been come to me even for guidance, the first thing I always start with is their breath. The breath mm -hmm. is so, so powerful. Yeah. And we just don't even realize what we have within us and to utilize all that we have within the chemistry, within the breath. It's simple, simple things. And it's not rocket science, but it's just we don't we Look, don't put it into practice. You know, Moses was doing this, yeah. you know, this is people thousands of years ago were, were practicing this generation to generation. And it seems that it was taken away from us. Mm. And it, it's the most simplest thing in the world. And like for myself, I'm on that journey as well. And I have detached myself from so many things. But do you think one of the reasons why we as a society are not there is because we want a sense of urgency with everything. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do. I, you know, and people want the, 
the magic wand and the, the quick fix. And the thing is, this is something you have to do, you know, yeah, on bees, tr being still is a massive um, challenge for people. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, hu it's a huge challenge for, I know, but I was still, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't have the tools. I didn't know any of this. So I had so much time on my hands when I was sick, but that's when it was, I was guided to, to discover these modalities and, um, and tools, I suppose, that for life. For and that's life what it, you know, if we start, and it's one of the things that we don't teach our kids, we don't teach our kids, you know, ethics, we don't teach them compassion. We should be teaching these uh, to our kids in the schools where we get them to understand that their, their mind will start to give them stuff that is unnecessary, that doubt and fear that they get. And we, we have to sort of stop that as well and start teaching that in them. But that's also has to, it also has to come from parents as well, Joe, I feel, because as parents, we expect our children to change. But if we're not willing to change ourselves, or if we don't know, you know, I think it's a balance of both. So we need to educate our, our children, but we also need to educate ourselves. Well, yeah, you can't, you have to teach the parents and the persons then teach the children. Yeah. Because this life is wonderful. Like if you think about it, we'll talk people who talk about energy and talk to people about souls this body that we have like we smell flowers we swim we feel the wind on our faces we forget that life is amazing because we're all caught up in our own head and the neg negativity and everything like one of the things that i'm trying to get a message out to uh, people and it'll be one of the things i'll be i, I mentioned in a lot of my talks now is Fear not, because I think fear is where we are all living at the moment. And if we can raise a vibration, which is an energy above that, we can then alchemize all that fear and that negativity. And all you have to do with that is bring it up to joy. Like we like with 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 lockdown and with all what's happened in the last couple of months, we forgot to laugh. Yeah, we forgot to have joy. We got to belly ache. You know, it's it's complete bollocks. It's, you know, it, you know. Excuse my language, but yeah, yeah, it's, it it's is. True. But I I think people don't even realise that they have choice. That that the suffering sometimes is at the hands of ourselves. Majority is at the hands of ourselves through our own mind, our own thoughts. And you know, every morning you wake, you have a choice of how you're going to live your day. That's what I, that's what I do yeah. every morning is set myself up before, before the kids get up or, you know, that I had to prime myself to be the person I wanted to be so I could teach my children and also show them that there is another way, that it doesn't have to be all doom and gloom and fear. But, but isn't it funny? It's like we wake up in the morning, going, I'm going to have a great day and everything's going to be wonderful. I'm just going to be amazing. And you're, you're in the Zen mode and I call it the lovely Zen. And then mm -hmm. your kids get up and they go, I like have <laughs> a four year old and the four year old and a seven year old. They go, ah, kid and I hate you and you hate me. And, and you're trying to get them brush your teeth, get dressed. And my wife's saying, get dressed. And, 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 and you're kind of, you go from Zen to zero. You go, for fuck's sake, would you all shut up? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Is there, what are you doing? <laughs> ah, <geez up. laughs> you know, and you're going to go, oh, there, oh my God. And, and we get the kids out to school. And myself, my wife would say, we'd look at each other and go, what did Jesus happen there this morning? <laughs> <laughs> well, that is the best, isn't it? <laughs> There's nothing like your family to test you. Yeah, yeah. It, it, <laughs> to see it, how it, far it. along you are. And they're always great at reminding you, you know, yeah. of when you're losing it. It's when like, you're losing oh, indeed. where's your, all your positivity now? <laughs> so, and, and, and all my son goes, I thought you were Mr. Zen. Yeah. You know, go, <laughs> yeah. Know. Where do you think COVID is bringing us? I know a lot of people have, you know, there's a divide. And, you know, some people have a lot of compassion, some people don't. There's a lot of sniping. There, there's, you know, there's a huge turmoil in the world. Where, where do you think COVID's bringing us as, as a nation? Where do you think it's bringing humanity? Well, <laughs> uh, uh, personally, uh, 
you know, I'd love to say that it's all been, it's great. At the start, I thought this is going to be a major reset for humanity. I thought this is going to be amazing. Which you're right, it is, yeah. You know, and, and I still personally believe that, but I also can see how people are turning on one another, even within families and with friends. And, you know, it's re- the fear, the fear is rife. And it's, it can be scary to look at it if you're, if you look at it, it, it can be quite challenging because it has people that wouldn't even be really prone to um, depression and anxiety. You know, it's really heightened it for the collective, I feel. But I feel there's a lot of people doing amazing work to actually shift it. And I think if you don't invest your, you know, the negative energy into it, I try and try and stay balanced and try and observe both and try and um but isn't that the thing it's observing it is yes and and we do we all get drawn in like when people are bitching about stuff or you might have a go with someone about it that's just the, the, yeah. the human but it's correct me if i'm wrong and if anyone anyone can can dispute this or finding that the people that are more caught in their minds I know spiritually that everything is okay, that mm. I am in my own body. I am safe. I, I don't fear it. I know that it's been brought here to wake many up, the dark mm-hmm. night of the soul, drop you so far that it brings you back up on it. I'm not fearful. And I, and I see that the people that are angry, mm. are they people that are not, not following from their hearts, but are, are coming from their heads? Yeah, I'm like you, Joe. I don't have the fear. I just no. don't have it. And plus, I, I know about death. I've learned so much more about death. You know, than death is not, it does, it's not something I'm afraid of. I'm not you afraid. Like, yeah, like, like I've said it before, on my deathbed, I'm going to have my packed lunch and I'm going <laughs> to be here like this, Con. Right, I'll see you. Good luck. I'm going to find out about all this. Good luck. I'll see you on the other side, you know, because yeah. I've, I've, I've no fear on it at all. And, I'm getting into that really sort of deep level as well that I know that if something happens to me, it's okay. It's that time and I, I will move on that. It's sometimes it reminds me of the Christians in the, in the Colosseum with the lions where they had so much faith that the lions didn't go near them. I'm sort of at that. Some people might think I'm barmy, but I'm at that level of, mm. I know that everything is okay. I know that if we can get everyone up to the way of thinking like this, this sphere that we're on, which is a manifesting garden of Eden, will just transform overnight. Yeah, I do believe that the systems needed a good shakeup. I feel it's crumbling, you know, whether it be government, whether it be education whether it be religion you know it everything those falling. systems are, yeah. are crumbling the, you, you, yeah. i'm watching it's just it's just falling apart it, it, it's crumbling but it, needs, it needs a good reset i believe well everybody wanted to change everybody was yeah. sick everyone's earning more money but we were paying more debt and yeah. you know everything is at the world you know do we say the world has been better than it ever was but so many children die of starvation every every year and and then we want change we want change and i don't think people realize that it had to fall apart for that change and i think you know i've lost i've lost a mother a father i've lost a brother i've lost a sister to cancer you know i've all this these stuff battle hardness for life like yourself with your, with your own family mm-hmm. that I, th- I think COVID was really it's it's really torn everything on its edge for us to kind of go that's wrong what you are doing to us is wrong how you're controlling is the manipulation you know NLP at its finest yeah you know, absolutely yeah, yeah. Yeah. absolutely and um yeah like i i did get really angry at the start you know i was really 
invest in my energy and I was like oh hold on a wee minute <laughs> where are you going with this there's sometimes you need to come from a place of balance that you can make changes you know yeah. in a different way but not not with yes. anger because at the beginning there was anger and there was excitement yeah. this is new and we all felt like we are that this will just blow over and then it came more reality and then there was more stuff and you know they're like they're doing lockdown they're talking about lockdown at the moment but original lockdown was to get the they told us it was to get the beds ready mm. you know for this yeah. for this pandemic and it hasn't been as big I mean, my belief it hasn't been a, as big a pandemic as they thought it was thank god but yeah. they were still they still caught in this control and i think there's a lot of you know a, a lot of ego still churning up there yeah. um and we have to we have to be safe as well but it's it's it's, it's we're going to look back at this and go yeah no it we, we need to make changes we need to be back back in in back in our hearts instead of our heads on it yeah I, know, the, fr the frustration you know people are getting frustrated now at this stage but um, not, here's the thing human beings will go and meet and connect and laugh you can take yeah. thousands of years and go right now we're just going to put you in a box and change you you know unless you want to run like the communist regime did to the Chinese people yeah. and butchered and genocide millions of them and got them to comply. It can't do that because, you know, you're saying to people, oh, people will meet and laugh. After a while, people go, if you keep on doing this, a lot of people will go, oh, do you know, I'd actually rather be dead than live mm. in a box. I'm going to go wow. out and have fun. And I think I people die, are waking up that, that fact. You know, I think they're waking people up yeah really it's it, it, i i say it um every time you know it, it, a, a new brule or a uh, a lockdown happens you know a million more people wake up and i cheer yay yeah that's yeah that's i that's what i think anyway but. that's what i would think that's what i, think. <laughs> I hope that, that's what we think and we're sticking to it <laughs> so look t tell me this then life-changing experience understanding the mind getting through to the way things are where, where's it all leading to and you know we can all sort of say oh i don't know i'm on a roll but where is it leading to where is it helping kids is it like where's the passion where's the drive for me yeah yeah, yeah. my um <laughs> my passion you know i love the learning i love the educate educating myself as well but to help the next generation, to, to teach our children, because there's so much I have, especially with suicide, I, I have, it just gets me because I've been there. I understand it. I've been in that low place where I, I did want to end my own life. And, you know, I get pretty frustrated about our mental health system, to be honest with you. So, um, but I believe that I went through a lot of shit to actually make changes and to try and create a new program or something for for our kids and for people to believe in themselves it's about self-empowerment really but that's what it is it's it's yeah it's like suicide is a confliction mm -hmm. and it, it's when people realize that what's going on here and they speak it out it saves their lives and that's what we like. How many suicides were in Galway in September? Some 20, 20. 20 figures that we're not being told about. It's know? huge around here at the moment, you know. And, it's huge um, all over the country. Yes, yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I have done work with suicide prevention and running courses and everything. But I still feel there's such a lot of work still to be done. And um, I, where am I going? I don't necessarily know. I know I'm always guided and I'm, I trust the guidance that I receive. And it is, that is the, the part that I've been told that I need to, to work on. It, it, it's, it's interesting talking about the suicide because, and we were talking about COVID because people have been hurt about the virus. People have suffered be, because of lockdown physically, mentally, and emotionally. And I yeah. think there's the stuff that we 
we're not we're not talking about mm. you know are you taking a stance and are you finding the courage because you know we spoke earlier about you know there was that element of fear or you know and that's what what holds us all back really have you found that courage to kind of go look i actually don't care what other people think anymore and i am now going to express my sovereignty and who i am yeah only recently mind you <laughs> yeah, yeah you know it's not that long ago you know i was still worrying about what people think of me is this the right thing to do questioning myself what will others think i'm not, i'm done with it i'm done with that you done know and all, I, yeah yeah, yeah. And I have just finished a, a three-week program with people about self-love because we haven't been taught how to love ourselves, Joe. Do you know, and I think that's part of the problem is we don't accept all parts of us. The good, so what, the bad, what the is, ugly. What is self-love? Give some tips then. What would you say? What is, what is self-love? Because I think people don't really can't define what love is. I think when yeah, people but, think love, they think it's, I need to get someone to love me. I love my dog or, you know, I don't think people really understand what unconditional love is. And that's part of the problem is, you know, we, we, we give away our power to other people and we expect others to actually provide our needs. But if you give it to yourself, because I didn't, I had to learn this too. I didn't even like myself. I had so much guilt, so much shame, so much I had to forgive and when you work through that, when you go through the program, it, it, it makes you aware of the beliefs that you have, that you've carried forward as well from that are not even yours. Start to open up your, your mind and see, God, this isn't even what I really truly believe inside. Do you know, and respecting yourself instead of being afraid of what others are thinking of you. you don't, but I, we don't know this stuff. Like, you know, it might be common to some people, but it's not. For the majority, people don't realise. Yeah, I love myself. I think I'm deadly. Yeah, well, fair play to you because <laughs> I definitely didn't. Well, I think but, I wasn't deadly. I think you were. Both. You insulting me now. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need a bit of humour too, don't we? Don't tell my wife. Don't. Happy in my own solitude. But yes. that's it, isn't it? It's, it's really like I'm happy with myself. I'm comfortable with myself. Mm. I've, you know, I still have that demon of, you know, when I, if I go on stage or, you know, talking without, without being an interview, I, I don't f the fear inside me. And then even where I'm staring to where I want to speak about as well, the truth is that's been very difficult for me as well. But I, I think it's, I think it has to be done. I think as more and more people wake up, people are looking for people to kind of go, I'm here. I'm where you were, you know. Yeah, and it's also hard to find words. Sometimes I think language is a huge barrier. You know, it's all about how you're feeling. You, you know, can sing. La -da -da. <laughs> da -da -da -da. Can't do that either. <laughs> <laughs> you can sing. Go well, I could sing. try it. You know, but yeah, um, I do so, wonder how I've how I got through and spoke when I was so nervous and such anxiety. And to be in such a bad place, how I did do things in the past, where now I'm a bit more apprehensive. I'm going to well. ask you something. I'm going to ask you, we're, 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 we're coming to the end of the clock with a few minutes left, but I'm going to ask you something. Do you feel all the tragedy that happened to you, mm -hmm. do you feel you need to tell that as part of your story? Do you know, like, we all have that dark night of soul. We all have that tragedy. Do you think you need to express that as part of your story? Or do you need to kind of go, I have that in here. This matters to me. No one else really needs to know that because I know it. And now I'm going to show people how life should be really lived. Yeah, I think, I think it is important to me mm. because it shows people well, if you can do it, I can do it. That's yeah. to me personally. Yeah. I think it gives people hope. And it's not about a comparison thing. It's not a competition. It's to show, okay, you can be in the gutter. You can be on your knees. And that's generally when you think you're breaking down is when you're going to break through. I think it's, I think it's important for me 
to share because um yeah i it can be difficult but it's yeah, the, the, the reason there's two everyone's because it brings up that it does it bring up that heartache or does it bring up that healing and the second part of the royal mass as well because sometimes when i tell people my own story i go oh here we go again i have to tell yeah. the story again i go oh do you know and I've heard I've, this is me going I've heard I know. my story a hundred times <laughs> blah, 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 you know yeah uh, I think a narrowed down version is is yeah. sufficient because if I, I was I, that's it we are we are mad we are we are indeed <laughs> we are but we can hap- laugh at hap- ourselves happily mad happily yes. mad on it if someone wants to reach out to you if someone wants to you know jump on that course which I think is important a self-love course you know, um, how do they get in touch with you? To well, really, just through Facebook and Instagram, really, or email um, is the platform at the moment. But I know that's all changing as well. Um, so it's taken the time now to to get. I I really do like working one to one as well, which is I feel energy. Yeah, I feel. I, I stuff, love you know. working one to one. Yeah, I, do. I, I do. really do. Want it jump on facebook have you got a facebook page facebook yeah, just, yeah. Oh, either my personal one is martina crudden or martina crudden health and wellness, and wellness is, yeah yeah then i have private groups for clients as well so it's um, I'll, I'll touch a base on it yeah just to keep everybody i suppose that community i think is very community important to keep yeah cool. martina thanks for coming on the show thank you joe thanks for having me You're listening to Joe Dalton on Dublin South FM, Crossing the Rubicon.